sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Hi there, and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Rosalind Sina, the Chief Communications Officer for the Library of Congress, and we appreciate that all of you have joined us this afternoon. We'll be talking with author, comedian, math wizard, and host, Matt Parker about his book, Humble Pie, When Math Goes Wrong in the Real World. You'll have opportunities to ask Matt, Matt your questions. So start thinking along and um, just send it our way and I'll ask Matt all your questions. So let's get right to it. Matt, welcome. He's joining us from the UK. I should say though, I finished your book last Friday. It's like, you know, math gone wild, math gone bad. Um, but before we get to your book, you know, the theme of the National Book Festival is open a book, open the world. What books open the world to you? Oh, wow. Uh, th uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction as well, Roswell. I've, that's the first time I've been introduced as a math wizard, and I think I will stipulate that from now on. All my introductions must be wizard-based. I uh, highly appreciate that, uh, which is not that far from my answer to your next question of um, maths that kind of opened the world. And I'm in an interesting situation because I actually grew up in Australia. I'm Australian. I lived there for the first uh, couple of decades of my life. And then I moved to the UK, where I am now. Um, and growing up in, in Australia, I used to read, as a kid, a lot of um, fiction from, from around the world. And actually, I should have, because I, I read Encyclopedia Brown. That's a US series. Something about a brother, my brother, the big brain. I forget the name of that series. But so I read, like, so a lot of my impression uh, as a child in Australia who never traveled to other countries was based on the fiction I read at the time. And so um, growing up, I read a lot of Roald Dahl and Enid Blyton. A lot of Enid Blyton when I was much younger. And when I moved to the UK, I didn't realize how much I had not distinguished between what was like uh, like the magic faraway tree made up fantasy and just literally England. And so the first time I went like to the seaside and they like literally got buckets and pails and things, I'm like, oh my goodness, this, I, I had to work out what was real and what was fantasy from, from growing. And to, to, this, to this day, I'm still, still prizing that apart. So I, I feel like it, my childhood books, reading Eden Blyton and Roald Dahl, like opened the world to me. But yeah, I wasn't careful enough to work out uh, what could be trusted and what couldn't. I should say though, let's get to your book. Your book um, opened my eyes to a lot of um, math problems that have gone on in history, I should say. You know, you take a little tongue in cheek approach to the book, but a lot of it's quite serious. Um, what was the genesis of the book? What made you think, I need to write about this? Oh, it was because um, this is this, the Humble Pie, the second book I wrote. And the first book I wrote was called Things to Make and Do in the Fourth Dimension. And it was because as a, a high school teacher, um, a lot of my job uh, prior to becoming an author and comedian and wizard was uh, finding engaging ways to communicate math uh, to people. And so my first book was very much aimed at the already slightly math curious, uh, semi nerd, where I could try and, you know, communicate all these amazing like things in the fourth dimension, really uh, abstract, bizarre bits of mathematics. And, and the book did, did well. It did good for a math book, average for a book. And so my publisher was like, okay, um, how, what can we do if you want to hit a wider audience? And I was like, ah, this is this I'm interested in. How can I uh, find a vehicle where a, a bigger range of people, the, the, the less convinced proto-nerds will want to read the book? I thought, well, everyone enjoys a story of something going wrong. And so I, I pitched a book. I said, hey, what if I write a book about all the, like, the greatest math mistakes whenever math has gone horribly wrong? And they're like, ah, now that's, that's something people, people want to read. And I'm thinking it's a great excuse for me to then talk about, like by talking about when it goes wrong, I get to talk about the incredible amount of math which is holding our society together that we never notice. Or rather, we only notice when it does go wrong. I mean, some of it, you say um, keeping the world together, um, some of the math examples that you made were literally you know, keeping things together from bridges to architecture to um, the space shuttle, 
to just advertising campaigns. Um, you know, I, I kind of joked about it earlier. A lot of it is tongue in cheek, but you know, a miscalculation can have like very deadly consequences. How are you able to balance the fun and the serious in the book? Yeah, that's an interesting one because we were chatting about this before that um, the book was meant to be a comedy book about mathematics. And that's what I promised the publishers. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, there's like in things like, uh, you know, engineering with bridges, like you say, medicine, uh, uh, all, so well, all sorts of um, aerospace and uh, planes. If it goes wrong, people die. And I was like, I can't have like every second story can't end. And then everybody died. I'm like, oh, I've got to. So partly, I was uh, strategic with what stories I put in. So I can say, actually, of all the aviation stories, nobody dies. So every story involving a plane, if you're scared of flying, I mean, the book's not going to help. But uh, no one, no one dies in any of the plane stories. And then when I did put in, because I, I didn't want to shy away from the seriousness. It was just a case of being careful when I put in the stories where people die, uh, having a reason for choosing those specific stories where I think there's an important lesson and being respectful at, at looking at it. So people died, um, as well as uh, obviously engineering, when bridges and buildings collapses, which are pr pretty horrific. Like there, there's been mistakes where um, a simple line of code that was wrong in some software for a machine that would, was doing like radiotherapy for cancers, uh, caused multiple deaths because of the way the code was written. And I was like, that is terrifying. But I would be doing a disservice to not bring that up and to make sure, you know, on one hand, I'm trying to say it's fine to make mistakes. We're all bad at math. We're going to make mistakes. But on the flip side, sometimes if it's a life or death situation, you got to get it right. So I felt I had to put those in. You didn't hold any punches here with some of the people um, or some of the, I guess, examples that you use. I mean, you used NASA as an example, you used the UK government um, from McDonald's to Pepsi to British Airways. Um, what kind of reaction did you get from these companies and from these governments? You know what? It was interest and it was interesting to see the difference between private companies and government agencies. So anything with a private company, I never got anything officially back from a private company. And so things like the Pepsi case, and this was a case where um, they miscalculated a number in an advertisement. I, should, I, I love this story so much. If you want to kind Pepsi. of summarize it for the it's people watching, that would be great. So good. It, it, the short version is they had an ad in uh, 1995 where if you collect Pepsi points, you could um, get uh, like a leather jacket or a hat, uh, all these sorts of things. I'm just seeing if I, I don't have that within reach. I thought I might have um, some of the images from that. Oh, here we go. You know what? I can, if I get this to work, here we go. So this, this is from the commercial that ran in 1995. If you collected 75 Pepsi points, you get a t-shirt. If you uh, collect, uh, 1,450 Pepsi points, you get a leather jacket, you can get some sunglasses. It was the 90s, right? But then they wanted to end the ad on a kind of hilarious, zany joke. So after the sunglasses, they had a, like a Harrier jump jet. And for 7 million Pepsi points, you could get this military jet. Ha, ha, ha. That's all very funny. However, those jets at the time cost the US military 20 million US dollars. And Pepsi points, as long as you got enough from a Pepsi container, you could put in a check for the rest. And they were only 10 cents each. So that jet would only cost you $700,000 for a $20 million jet. I have no idea what the resale market like is for these things. But uh, that's a good deal. And so someone did it. Someone filled in the form, put in the check, sent it off to Pepsi, had to go to court. And Pepsi had to argue that the ad was clearly a joke and it wasn't a serious offer for a contract. And th they won the case, they won the case. Um, but the whole thing was just because when they were writing the commercial, they didn't stop and think, how much is a jet worth? How much are the points worth? They just thought, oh, 7 million, that's a big number. And, and one of the themes in the book is how our brains are not naturally good at doing math, particularly big numbers. That's one of my favorite examples. And so when it comes to big numbers, 
our brain will go, oh, that's a big number, that's a small number, relative sizes, and it's normally wrong. Our brains are, and it's nothing personal, we're all bad at it. And so in, in, when they're writing this ad, it's a nice, simple, crisp example. They were like, oh, 7 million, massive number. Turns out the cost of the jet, even bigger number. And so um, they had to take it to court, and they won, and they changed the commercial and all that. But I couldn't get anything official out of Pepsi. So for something like that, it's only, I was only able to put it in the book because the court like uh, ruling in the court case, because now it's legal precedent, so good. Um, I was able to go and get all, I had to dig through and find all the court case results and then go through them. Whereas something like NASA, you were saying, something where it's um, a government thing, there's, there's a much more of an obligation to reveal what went wrong. And so for the government ones, you, you could almost think there's a bias that more things go wrong in the military and on government contracts and with NASA and with ESA in Europe. But it's just, it's um, selection bias because we hear about those stories because they're obliged to divulge them. And so I'm digging through pages and pages of all these official inquiries and investigations, going back some of them to like, I'm reading inquiries from the 1800s on why bridges collapsed and all these things. But it was all made public and stays public and, and you can see it. Whereas what you don't see are the, um, the dark stories, like dark matter. So there was one story I really wanted to put in the book and I knew about it because the engineer involved was a friend of mine. And when I asked them, can I put this in the book? They were like, there is no way. They are under so many non-disclosure agreements and, and the company and the contractors and there, there was a 0% chance for even quite a trivial math mistake from one of their projects that I could put it in the book. And so sadly, a lot of stuff that's done by private companies is simply not in there because we either don't hear about it. And if I did hear about it, it was so off the record, I couldn't put it in the book. You know, what's, what was aggravating for me was um, when, whether they're companies or um, governments, you know, if somebody brings up like a simple math mistake that they did or, you know, or something more elaborate, they become so defensive. Um, and I like, you, you wrote something that I kind of sums everything up. My main point was there that there is a general feeling in society that math is not that important, that it's okay not to be good at it. But so, but so much of our economy and, and technology requires people who are good at math. I mean, I know this stems from the, you know, the soccer ball or the football, I mean, the UK, yeah. but I feel like, um, People are not, despite it's a very serious subject matter, you know, I feel like math is our universal language. Some people just don't take it too seriously, even if it is a something, yeah. you know, an, like an advertising campaign. Or and, and a little bit of me, when I was writing the book, was me having flashbacks to when I was a teacher. So I taught teenagers for several years. When I was like a high school teenager, and even doing the training, Students are always like, why do we have to learn this? Which is fair enough, right? And parents would say that as well. Why do my kids have to learn this? I'm terrible at math. Of course, they're bad at math. I'm like, don't give them permission to be bad. Like, teenagers don't need any help coming up with excuses. Um, but you see this from, from teenagers. Why do we have to learn this? And so part of what I was doing uh, with the book was, like, answering that question, like, once and for all. And um, hopefully it's been a good resource. I know a lot of teachers have now used this, they can go through and find examples before they teach, you know, uh, statistics and averages, before they teach triangles, before they, you know, uh, teach numbers and log scales and these things. They can find examples of when people didn't bother learning that and things went wrong as a consequence. And so for me, it was a big part of the answer to the, why do I need to know this? And as you say, just in general, I think it's so disappointing that math has enabled our society to do such incredible technological things. But it's almost so good at it and it's so behind the scenes that people don't even realize the extent to which their lives have been bettered by math and the extent to which we need more people who are m mathematicians or just mathematically confident to go into these careers and invent these new things and keep the whole system ticking over. How important it is that we uh, have people going through the math education system, coming out the other side, becoming programmers, engineers, researchers, scientists, uh, economists, and all walks of life. 
there's been such a major push for STEM in, in, in schools, um, especially here in the US. What advice do you want to give parents out there who have you know, kids at home who have like, who don't love math or are very reluctant to learn or just don't have the drive to learn? Um, and I should say though, just reading this book, it does make it very feel very exciting and just maybe lays out the importance of math. But how do you kind of sell that to a kid? Yeah, it's a tough sell. And I think the biggest thing is, as I, I, I um, mentioned in passing a moment ago, I distinctly remember being in a parent teacher, like on a parent teacher night, talking to a parent or one of my students who, who said pretty much word for word, I'm not good at math, so of course my kid isn't, isn't good at math. And for me, that's like the, the opposite of what you should be doing. So at a minimum, not actively discouraging the, the, the child. And that can be, you know, uh, it deliberately or subconsciously. The thing is, math, like, is not as hard as you remember it being. Like, it's the worst time in your life to be forced to sit down and learn mathematics when you're a teenager. You've got so many other things and other priorities going on. And so if you remember it as being this incredibly difficult thing, it's not as bad as you remember. And if you can have a positive attitude and if you can and be like, oh, I, you're right. I also don't understand that, but we can learn it together and, and all these things. And one of the big things I go on about is that everyone finds math difficult and, and acknowledging that, accepting that, and that not being an excuse to not learn it. Like a lot of things you learn that are important are difficult, but with mathematics, because everyone finds it difficult, the people who become mathematicians or you know, math enthusiasts, us math wizards, it's not because we find math easy, it's because we enjoy the fact it's difficult. And so that's an important subtlety people miss. They go, oh, people who are good at math, they're different. They, they, they find it easy. No, they find it as difficult as anyone else. They've just, they enjoy the fact it's a challenge. And like any kind of learning a skill or exercising, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And in math, it, it, a lot of it is accumulative. Once you understand one bit, then the next bit is a lot easier. And the next bit's a lot easier. Whereas if you just come slamming in halfway up, you find it incredibly difficult. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not as hard as you remember and embrace the difficulty and that's not an excuse to let your kids off the hook. I see some questions coming in, so I just kind of want to encourage our audience to keep on sending your questions and we're going to get to them shortly. Um, I did mention just a few minutes ago, Matt, that I said that math is maybe like one of our, it's like our universal language understood around the world. Then it just dawned on me, like here in the US, we still use, um, you know, English while the rest of the country, the yep, rest of the world or most of the world uses the metric system. There's one example in your book, um, yep. if you want to summarize it very quickly to how it almost became very, um, disastrous, I should say, um, by the, 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 the weighing of pounds and, 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 and kilos when it came to a jet line. Got it. That's it. Up until then, I'm like, this could be several stories in the book. But yeah, mass and, and uh, jet line. So there was an aircraft. Uh, it was um, Flight Air Canada, Canada 173, Air, I think. I think. Yeah, it was, in nine, it was in the 1980s, and Canada had just switched from imperial English, like traditional units, to uh, the metric system. And aircraft fuel is not measured in uh, volume, it's measured in mass. And that's because if the temperature of it changes, its volume changes. And so you've actually got, you haven't got more or less fuel, it's just taking up more or less space. But the mass stays the same. And so this flight, they'd calculated the mass of fuel required to fly from Edmonton to Montreal. So a reasonable distance across Canada. However, when they were fueling it, they, instead of fueling it in kilograms, they fueled it in pounds. And it's a conversion of about two-ish, 2.2. So it meant they accidentally put in half as much fuel as the flight would require. And the long version of the story is just insane. Like all the things, number one, all the things that had to go wrong, there was multiple technology and math mistakes for this plane to take off with half as much fuel as it needed. But then uh, everything that, like no one died. Just to recap, then, then yeah. what they did like to survive it and everyone was fine, it's just what an incredible story. And for me, I love it because it's such a great example. If students are ever like, oh, why do we have to learn? Like, why do we just have to write our units? Why do teachers go on and on about what units is that in? Well, this is why you get the units wrong suddenly you got over 80 people on an aircraft with no fuel. So 
Pay attention. I was asking you earlier, you did your homework, um, you know, when you go to each case study here. Um, how much time did that take and how much, you know, work did that, you know, you had to dig through to, you know, to find the real answers of what happened? Yeah, that's a, it's interesting because I also work uh, doing videos on YouTube and I, I work uh, doing um, shows and performances and I still do some work in schools with young people. I was dipping in and out of writing this book over the course of about three years, give or take. I reckon, um, which, which is good because, as I was saying before, a lot of the research just takes time. Like I've got to, for some of it, I'm like, oh, I've got to find that report and the report is only in certain libraries, it's not been digitized yet, and I gotta find a way to get it scanned and then and sent to me. So a lot of it is just, I've gotta get the ball rolling early, and then I can dip in and out, and then just keep the research being bumped along. So uh, definitely not full time, but it was three years from beginning the research and pulling these threads to see where they lead, to having the, the finished research done and the manuscript a manuscript handed over to a very relieved editor. I should say, I was very impressed. You know, Matt Parker's book is Humble Pie, When Math Goes Wrong in the Real World. For everybody watching, we do want to remind you that there is a great resource for teachers and students on the library's website. The link's up there on your screen. Um, let's get to some questions here. I think we have a question from Niels Nielsen. That's a name for you. Um, I love it. Um, his question is, since we all rely on calculators and computers to do the math, how can we learn to detect when the answer is wrong? Yeah, great question, Neil Squaredson. I'm going to look for that. Um, it's true. And people can get too reliant on calculators, and they don't do a sense check. And th there's different degrees of sense check. So actually, one of the stories in the book, someone using a calculator made a simple calculation error and uh, gave the wrong dose of a medication to a patient. And it was huge repercussions uh, just because they didn't stop and think, does that answer make sense? And again, teachers go on and on about this. Do you want to do a sense check? So one thing you can do is just and like, uh, the technical name is like an order of magnitude check. We just think how big are the numbers I'm multiplying or dividing, roughly how big should the answer be? And, and just by, even just stop making you stop and think, does this make sense? I had to do that just today. I had to do a calculation where it was a ridiculous calculation. Um, someone had sent in a question to me asking, I do a podcast where I answer ridiculous problems and questions, and someone said, how long would a roll of toilet paper be if it was made of graphene, which is like one molecule thick? And so, and this is in no level of importance whatsoever. If I get this answer wrong, nothing is gonna happen other than I'll be mildly embarrassed if someone points it out. But I still did the whole calculation properly and calculated it exactly. And then I leant back and went, well, what should it be? And I thought roughly, what's the thickness difference? What's this, what's that? And I just did like a sense check of, is my answer roughly the right size? Just to double check. And the extreme version of that is engineers will do, it's called dimensional analysis, where you redo the same calculation, but instead of putting numbers in it, you put units in it and all the equations and formulae from engineering and physics work just as well with units as they do with numbers. And if you then do this as like a parallel calculation and you make sure you get the right units out the other side, it's one more way of checking that what you did in the calculator was correct. Good question. That is a great one. So we have a question here from Sarah. She's asking if you could dispel one commonly misunderstood thing about math, what would it be? Wow, it would be, I mean, apart, I've already gone on at adequate length about how we're all bad at math and blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh, ignoring that one, it would be that math is just about numbers and people equate math with arithmetic. And that's like, yes, arithmetic is part of math, don't get me wrong, but it's like saying all music is playing the piano. You know, yeah, that's one part of it, but there's so many other ways to make music than playing the piano. And playing the piano is wonderful, but there are other things. And for me, that's how I feel when people equate math to just numbers. I'm like, no, but math is the study, like it's, it's discovering, enjoying, and exploiting patterns. That's mathematics. And so I, I feel like it's a real shame that so many people think that math isn't 
like this wonderful solving puzzles, discovering patterns adventure that it is, and they think it's just adding together bigger and bigger numbers. We have a question here from Bob Perillo. Um, let me pull out my glasses here. Um, he's asking, Structure, structured programming has been around for 50 years. Fault intolerant languages like Ada and Rust. Why have major software projects been so fault laden? Bob is asking. Wow, great question, Bob. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good point. And it's because software is written by humans. And you're right, maybe we should have like, Software. So, so what Bob's saying is you've got different languages you can write computer code in, just like you've got different languages you could write a novel or a poem in, right? Um, and they've all got their pros and cons. And so the ones here, like uh, Ada and Rust, are, are solid, like robust. And some languages, it's more obvious if there's a mistake or something gone wrong. Whereas, uh, personally, I code a lot in a language called Python, if people want to look into that. Huh, Python is uh, so many ways things can go wrong but it's also super user-friendly. And so uh, I would say that the, the two prongs to why we have so many software problems, partly software is just insanely complex and so interlinked. And secondly, it's written by humans and constantly adapted. And so uh, the uh, ESA example, the European Space Agency, they had an aircraft that um, it was a, a mistake in the code which caused the rocket on its launch to suddenly veer off. There's no, no humans. It wasn't a staffed flight. There were, there were no humans on board. It was uh, actually, it was a bunch of spacecraft, including my wife is a um, space scientist, and some of her colleagues had a group of satellites called the Cluster Satellite on there. And so they'd spent decades working on their spacecraft, and then the thing blows up. And so they were so sad. But what it got wrong is basically it was, it was a failure of reusing code uh, without testing it properly. That was it. So it was partly human nature to copy and paste, and partly it's very difficult to test for all edge cases. And so they ported this code from the previous rocket and hadn't checked the size of some values that would be going through it. Yeah, so it exploded over uh, French Guinea, and uh, th they sent back the crumpled bits of metal. So in the uh, coffee room in um, the space science lab where my wife works, they've got these charred bits of spacecraft as a reminder that uh, one line of code and all your hard work can uh, end up on fire in a swamp. Yeah, I, we do only have a few more minutes here. So I'm gonna combine two questions here that are very similar. One is from Mary. She's asking, how can we all help make math more relevant to ordinary life? And Robert's asking something similar, like many learners avoid math because it is black and white, meaning it's right and wrong with no room for errors with much red ink discourages. How do we increase enjoyment of math? So how do we make it relevant to the, our daily lives and how do we enjoy it more on a daily basis, I guess, to combine these questions? Oof. I think the answer to both is to not be scared of it. And so I know we've talked about a bunch of terrifying, you know, math goes wrong, everybody dies, or your know, rocket blows up or whatever. But that's, like, there's a distinction between math when you're doing something important and math when you're uh, messing around. And so I think, for, in terms of everyday life, people having, I describe it as, like, mathematical confidence. So if you're, um, I don't know, hiring a car and they offer you car insurance and you're like, do I take it or not, don't, don't, freak out because you've, all these numbers are coming at you. Just have the confidence to go, no, no, I can work this out and just relax. I do that. I'm like, hang on a second. I get my phone out because we've all got calculators on our phones and I get a pen if I need to. And I, I, I don't know the answer straight away. I can't do the math in my head, but I've just got the confidence to know I'll give it a go and see what happens. And actually, in general, just give it a go. There's all sorts of fantastic math puzzles uh, and uh, interesting investigations and things you can do. And so I uh, work a lot as a recreational mathematician, and that just means I'm doing it for the sake of it. I'm having fun. I anticipate making a lot of mistakes. Math is more getting it wrong than getting it right by a long shot, but that's because you're learning things that are new and you're trying to discover things that are new to you. I feel like the answer is also like what we, when we're asked, how do we make our kids read or how do we make our people read? I, uh, the usual answer we usually give is, you know, make it fun, you know, do it at the checkout stand, do it, uh, you know, do it when you're on a road trip and just, you know, try to make it more fun and make it less, you know, textbook and very less, 
intimidating. Um, we have time for one more question. I feel like this is the one question everybody's dying to ask you. What is your favorite shape? And we will be get and when will we we be getting any more user submitted code videos? And what is up with the Christmas tree behind you? <laughs> uh, favorite shape is the rhombic dodecahedron. That was easy. Um, over this behind me, this is my Christmas tree. I, in hindsight, I should have moved it out of the background. I programmed this last Christmas. It's got 500 lights on it, and I mapped their 3D coordinates and had 3D effects going across it. And the user submitted code is because people sent in code that I then ran on my Christmas tree because I open sourced Power It All Works. Since so people sent in code and I ran it. And this is what I love about the internet. I put a video out of just me running other user submitted code on my tree and it's had 4.9 million views. And I, I love the fact everyone's like, oh, math and technology and programming is boring. No one likes it. It's a chore. But we do this stuff for fun. And 5 million people can't be wrong. Oh, maybe they can or be wrong. I don't know. But I love the fact that if you told people before YouTube, 5 million people would watch me debug code on my mathematical Christmas tree, they wouldn't believe you. But yet, here we are. Just say, Matt Parker, the author of Humble Pie, When Math Goes Wrong in the Real World, we really appreciate it. You really do make math fun. So, as you mentioned, 5 million viewers and counting, and you're doing your part to make math fun. So we want to thank everyone for you know, participating and watching on this Sunday afternoon. We greatly appreciate it. This is day three of the National Book Festival. If you want to create your own National Book Festival experience, just go to our website, loc.gov slash bookfest, and enjoy all the videos. Again, thank you, Matt, and take care to everyone. Roswell, thank you so much.